are Plum Creek, and we are a place where you matter. Our mission here is centered around change lives, changing lives. We believe this happens through three relationships, intimacy with God, intentionality with family, and influence with others. God has something He wants to say specifically to you wherever you are. Our hope is that you will leave encouraged and closer to Him than ever before. We'd love to connect with you online at PlumCreekOnline.com or on social media where you can see how Plum Creek is impacting our community and what opportunities we have for you and your family to get connected. If you'd like to support the ministry we're doing here in Castle Rock, the two easiest ways are through the Give tab on our website or via your mobile device by texting your dollar amount to the number on the screen. Thanks again for joining us. We hope you'll enjoy this message. Uh, it is my privilege and, and honor to introduce you guys to uh, a, a very dear friend of mine. Um, Jimmy, as, as I've, we've no, I've known him for a few years now, and um, he has is, is blessed my life tremendously. I, I look up to him um, as, a, as a pastor, um, as a musician, and as a, as a friend. Um, and there's been many times I was uh, facing some hard things in life. I'd get a phone call from Jimmy just saying, hey, man, how, how you doing? And he's the real deal. And uh, I have a, a great respect for his hair. And uh, it, if I could grow some luscious locks like that, I would, but I can't. So, uh, <laughs> but uh, we're very honored to have Jimmy and Sherry here. Their ministry um, uh, through, through music and Jimmy speaking in, in prisons and at Sturgis. Um, he, he'll be able to share uh, what they're doing this next week. And, and just his speaking all over the nation is truly changing lives. And his heart to introducing people to Jesus is the real deal. And I know you guys are going to be truly blessed today. So just, I want to invite you, just open up your hearts to what God wants to do this morning. And can we give a warm, warm Plum Creek welcome to Jimmy Bratcher. Thank you. Drug across up the hill. They laid him down and he took the kill. Buried him in a borrowed grave. He rose again on another day. He took the rap for my sin. Never feel that guilt again. Broke the chain, set me free. A sinner's hell I won't ever see. No, 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 no. One man hung, two men died. Third man rose to righteous life. Cursed is the man on a tree. Death for him, life for me. Death for him, life for me. Well, there he died, sin for all. He made it right for all who call. Beaten, punished, bruised within. I take his life, he takes my sin away. Takes my sin away. One man hung, two men died. Third man rose to righteous life. Cursed is the man on a tree. Death for him, life for me. Death for him, life for me.
down in death, he has gone. He stripped the devil, Jesus won. The earth shook, the stone rolled away. He has risen from the grave. One man hung, two men died. Third man rose to righteous life. Cursed is the man on a tree. Death for him, life for me. Death for him, life for me. Death for Kim, life for me. Thank you, thank you. I'm tuning. Well, Sherry and I, um, we find ourselves having a military family, not from us, but uh, from our children. And if you're here today and you're active duty or a veteran, we would just like to say thank you this morning to, to all of you. Our, um, our daughter Jessica spent 10 years in the Air Force, or her husband Leroy. Um, spent 21 years as a Marine, and today our, gr our grandson Seth is in Afghanistan, and in later this month, and his brother Aaron, will his unit will replace Seth's unit in, uh, in Afghanistan. So I wrote this song, it's about, uh, it's about the kingdom. I get a do-over on that one. There's got to be an end to this rainbow. One day I know, I know peace will come. Swords become plowshares when kingdom come. I'm hoping for a new solution, a planet of love. Lambs lay down with lions. hands of love no more crying tears wiped away mother father brother sister hand in hand that day when kingdom comes when kingdom comes this madness and not teach our babies a war Mary not when kingdom comes come Jesus Come. Peace will come in the hands of love. No more crying tears wiped away. Mother, father, brother, sister. 
sister hand in hand that day when kingdom comes when kingdom comes come Jesus come Thank you. Well, I'm thrilled today to be here. It's a real honor for me to be invited to speak in a church. Every Sunday we get to do that pretty much, but it's especially an honor when I don't know anybody here. You know, I don't know Pastor Doug. I know Craig, and and I'm getting to know everybody, and we've enjoyed the services this far, and uh, we're just thankful to be here. This is my wife, Sherry. Sherry, would you stand up? Sherry and I just celebrated 40 years of uninterrupted marriage, and uh, we have three kids. Our son Jason's in Dallas. He's a chef and works for State Farm. Our daughter Amanda is in outside of Kansas City, which is where we live, and Amanda works for our ministry, and then our daughter Jessica and her husband Leroy are in Washington, D.C. They work for the Defense Department. And so we're thrilled to be here. I do have some resources that we brought that help us with our ministry. Uh, first, let me mention my book. This is a book of encouragement because I'm an encouragement junkie. I don't need a stream of encouragement. I don't need a river of encouragement. I need an ocean of encouragement coming into my life. And so I wrote this book. It's titled, Don't Take Your Dreams to the Grave. You know, one of the things that happens when you get older is you start to have self-doubt about your dreams. And so I want to encourage you to get busy pursuing those things. So I wrote this book really for guys like me that aren't avid readers. So it's got big print, short chapters, and lots of stories. It's got everything going for it except pictures. There's also some teaching resources out there on the table. We have a couple of relationship series out there. This one is called The Marriage of Your Dreams. Sherry and I have counseled thousands of couples in their relationships, and so we consolidated all that down and put it in this and another series out there on the table called You're Not the Boss of Me. And I just like saying that, you know, you're not the boss of me. And then our music, my music keeps us focused outside of the church. For instance, today when we leave here, we'll get on a plane and fly to Sturgis, South Dakota. And tomorrow, uh, we've been invited by the largest, largest music venue there, the Buffalo Chip, uh, to play tomorrow night, my band and I will be opening for the Doobie Brothers, so we're kind of excited about that. And uh, so we have a new CD that's coming out tomorrow. This is a missions project for us. We do these every now and then, and we send CDs out to blues radio around the world. This one's already had over 100 radio stations play it here in the United States and all over Europe. It's called This is Blues Country. It's classic country songs in blues style, so I just took some country songs and rearrange them. Both songs that I sang today are on my CD exchange, which is a devotional CD. And then finally, there's a DVD on the, on the table called The Little Girl Wins, and it's a DVD about the story of a father and daughter being restored. I mentioned my daughter, Jessica. Well, we didn't meet Jessica until 2011 when she was 38 years old. And so this is the story of how all of the events came into line just right with God working behind the scenes to bring, sorry, my beautiful daughter and her four grandsons into our lives. So anyway, I have a gift for you. Let me just mention that real quick. If you look up on the screen, there's a slide there that talks about a sermon series that I have called How to Be a Spiritual Giant in 60 Seconds or Less. So if you get your smartphone out right now and just type that web address in there, the revjb.com slash sg, the revjb.com slash sg, and uh, it'll just start delivering to your to your email. There's short, there's short sermons. That's a good idea. Just take a picture of the screen. 
the Rev JB, is it still up there? Could you put it back up there for a second? Somebody's still taking it. Here you go. Just take a picture of it, and then you can look it up later. But uh, it, it'll just start delivering to your email. They're short. They're only like three to five minute messages, but it's just encouragement, especially us guys need reassurance that we are spiritual giants. So anyway, all that's out of the way. I'm done singing. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much that we can be together, that we can hang out in your house, and that, Lord, we know that your presence is here. Thank you, Father, for the message today. Thank you, Lord. Help me to be a good deliverer of this message and help it to impact our lives in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Well, you know, when Jesus came on the scene, I love talking about Jesus. If you want to hang out with me very long, I'm going to be talking about Jesus because to me, Jesus is the big deal. He's the big deal. And when Jesus showed up on the planet, excuse my hippie term, he freaked some people out. He did. He freaked some people out because people were saying, look, we've never seen anything like this before. We've never heard anything like this before. Jesus was constantly freaking people out. And I don't know about you, but I want to be a wild man like Jesus was a wild man. And you know how Jesus was most wild? And how he treated people. And how he loved people. And I want to be like that. I want to be that guy. And I know you do too. That when people get around us, that our, our ethics, our morals, our character is such that they feel safe, that they feel connected, that they feel something. You know, the Bible says that Peter had this shadow, and they, they would lay sick people on the street hoping that his shadow would fall on them and they would be healed. You and I are no different than that. We have this aura, this attitude around us, and I want it to be that wild attitude of love and acceptance and just being with people. That's why we're going to Sturgis. I've chosen today as my text Proverbs 4.23. Proverbs 4.23. And it reads like this in the New King James Bible. It says, keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. You can tell that I'm having trouble breathing this morning. I miss my humidity from Missouri. I'm sorry. I just like that stuff. I'm addicted to it. The New Living Translation says, guard your heart above all else, for it determines the course of your life. The Bible here directs our attention to our heart because God is a heart God. God is a heart God. The residency of the Spirit of God is in our hearts. God comes to make up his abode in our hearts. Our hearts are the observation point of God. 1 Samuel 16, 7 says that God does not look as a man looks, for man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks upon the heart. So this verse directs us to our heart. Let's look at it again in the King James Version. It says, keep your heart with all diligence. That word diligence means the guard at the gate of the prison. We are to have, you know, Sherry and I, we go to prisons all over America. It's part of what we do. And every time we go, there's a guard at the, at the gate. He's to keep people in that need to be kept in and keep people out that don't need to come in. And we need that same type of spirit and attitude about our heart because there's some treasure in there that needs to be protected. And there are some things that don't need to come in. Let's look at it again. Keep your heart with all diligence, for out of it springs the issues of life. That word issues there, if you look that up in the Hebrew, it simply means the geographical boundaries or borders. You see, the limits of our life are not set by those things that are imposed from us from outside, but rather they're set by those things that we believe in our heart inside. That's why the Bible could tell us, to him who believes, all things are possible. So these limits that are imposed are based on our belief system. So today I want to encourage you and I want to challenge your belief system in two areas. Number one, I want to challenge you. Oh, by the way, I stole it. I titled this sermon, I stole it from the Eagle, the band, the Eagles. The title of the sermon is Take It to the Limit. There you go. All you Eagles fans out there. Take it to the limit. We got to be those people that are challenging, 
challenging those limits in our life. We have to be those people that are questioning the borders of our heart and seeing if they line up with the promises of God that he has made to us. Take it to the limit. So number one, I want to challenge you today to take your faith to the limit because faith is a big deal with God. If we're going to do anything with God, it's going to be on the basis of faith. And we need to be those people that are challenging the limits of our faith, opening up our hearts and saying, God, expand the boundaries of my faith. Because after all, it's faith, Hebrews 11, 6 says, that pleases God. So we please God by our faith. We had had an old van that we traveled in for many years, Sherry and I, called the White Pearl. We just got it replaced last January, and we are oh so grateful But the white pearl was a white trash treasure. And we were coming back from the East Coast one time, and the white pearl just kept going slower and slower. And finally, it just, you know, we limped it back home, and I took it to the car dealership, and they said, well, your catalytic converter's clogged, and it's going to cost $1,200. I said, man, the white pearl ain't worth $1,200. I'm going to get a second opinion. So I was talking to my neighbor, and he said, no, man. He said, just go down over the hill to Riverside, Missouri to raise muffler. And if you take Ray a plate of food, the bill will be cheaper. And so I went over to Ray's, and Ray said, yeah, your catalytic converter's clogged, and it'll be $300 cash money. You see, Ray didn't want no check. He didn't want no credit card. He wanted cold, hard cash. If you're going to do business with Ray, you're going to do business with Ray on the basis of cold, hard cash. And if you're going to do business with God, you're going to do business with God on the basis of faith. And the fun thing about faith is that God gives us his word that are full of promises that as believers in Jesus, we qualify for immediately. And so we need to be those people that are taking our faith to the limit because there are some people in your life that need your faith in them. They need to see that somebody actually believes in them. They need somebody to come alongside of them and look inside of them and see something good. We need to be those people that have that prophetic eye that can see inside of people and see the potential and then begin to exhort that potential, then begin to edify that potential, then begin to build up that potential. We need to be those people of faith. Point number two, I got two points and I'm on two. How's that? Point number two, we need to take our love to the limit. Love to the limit. Love is the expression of genuine faith. Galatians 5, 6 tells us that our faith works through love. So if we say that we have faith and we don't have love, then we don't really have genuine faith. And listen, love is the indefensible strategy of heaven. When heaven set out a plan for planet earth, love was what that plan was made on. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. It's the indefensible strategy of heaven. But we need to take our love to the limit first with each other. Now, I've been in church for 40 years. I can't believe I said that. For right near 40 years I've been in church. And I've been around some Christians that I just have to tell you that get on my last nerve. Come on now. When I was growing up, my sister Linda had this little cat named Buttercup, little Siamese cat. I love that cat. That cat was so cool because anytime Linda would talk anywhere in the house, that cat would fuzz up, find her, and attack her. I love that cat, man. That dude was so cool. And I've been around some Christians that I have the same type of response. You know, they start talking. I'm like, I kill you. And, uh, and we had a guy in our church like that one time, and every time he talked, man, it was like, You know, fingernails on the blackboard. I told the first service last night, you'll have to explain that to all the millennials in the audience. And he got on my nerves so bad, and he was the worship leader. And one day I was praying for him. Lord, take him out. Take him out. He needs to go to heaven right now. Take him out. And the Lord said, yeah, I'm going to take you out if you don't change that attitude. And so I said, okay, God, I don't have the capacity to love this man. So would you enlarge my ability to love him? And you know what happened is he became one of my very best friends in life. 
but only because I was willing to take my love to the limit with him. We've got to take our love to the limit with each other because it's important. Here's why. John 15, 35 says, By this will all men know that you're my disciples if you have love one for another. So when we have this thing of love working between us, then it rips a veil off of people's eyes so that they can see that we belong to Jesus. And taking our love to the limit with people that don't believe like us that is when the fun starts as a believer. I mean, that's really when it happens. So we need to take our love to the limit with each other, but we need to take our love to the limit with those that don't believe like we believe. That's what we get to do this week at Sturgis. We get to hang out with a half a million sinners. I just love doing that. But we, we figured this out. Okay, I'm done preaching. That's the end of my sermon. Now I'm going to tell stories for a minute. I have a couple of stories to tell. And all these stories have the same thing in common. And so I'm going to tell you up front so you don't have to try to figure it out. You know, but you're like me. I don't like using that much brain power. So here's what they have in common. Somebody invites somebody to come to church. I want you to say it with me. Say it with me. Somebody invites somebody to come to church. So that's a simple thing, right? Somebody invites somebody to come to church. A few years ago, there was some research done. And they went to people that didn't go to church and said, How, what would it take to get you to attend church? And they found that like over 90% at that time, it's dropped now, but over 90% of people that don't go to church said, we would be likely to attend if we were invited. So our culture is saying, hey, we'd like to see what you have going on. So they went to the church and asked church people how likely they would be to invite people to church. 2%. So we have a culture that says we would like to know what you have going on and we have a church that says, nah, nah, I'm not really interested. So we have to be those people that take our love to the limit. And the reason why I share this is because I'm an evangelist. And the most effective evangelistic means that we have right now in America is somebody invites somebody to come to church. So I'm challenging you today to take your faith in believing that somebody would respond, your love and having that compassion and concern enough for them to just invite them to come to church. So we had this going on. Cherry and I were on, ch on staff at a large church in northwest Missouri, and we were doing an event outside with our motorcycles, called it Church in the Park, and we were using our Harleys because they'll preach the gospel just like anything else will. And so somebody saw this guy running around town, and he was the epitome of a biker dude. You know, long hair, ponytail, full beard, tattoos everywhere, black Harley shirt, black jeans, black boots, and a black chain drive wallet. He had everything going on for him, motorcycle, except one thing, no motorcycle. But anyway, so somebody invited him to come to church, and he came. And when there was an opportunity for people to believe on Jesus, he came. And when I saw him coming, I said, there's a brother going to take some people's love to the limit right there. One Friday night, we had church on Friday night. He came, he, he worked all week, cashed his check, went straight to the bar, drank as much as he could, as fast as he could, because he didn't want to be late for church. So he came to church, and it wasn't just a few minutes after he got there. The ushers were all over him, and they came to me and said, Pastor Jimmy, there's a drunk guy over there. I said, well, is he bothering anybody? They said, Oh, no, he's real happy. I thought, well, praise God, maybe you can share that happening to some of these grumpy Christians running around here, you know. <laughs> One Sunday morning, he came, and he decided he was going to get all of God that he could get out of that service. And this is no offense to you all back there in the cheap seats, but it ain't the same back there as it is down front. Look, he's two rows, man, right here in the front row. I can't believe it. You all got it. You came for it. But he came. He found a seat on the second row, sat down to the next she sat down right next to Miss Prim and Proper. She just left her estate. She was dressed to the nines. And Richard sat down there, and I thought, yep, her love's going to the limit this morning. <laughs> she asked him what kind of work he did, and he said, well, ma'am, I'm a tattoo artist, and I do exotic body piercing. She lived a sheltered life. She said, you know, I've never seen anything pierced on anybody other than their ears. So Richard just lifted his shirt up to reveal his work right there on the second row of church. She came screaming out of her chair and found me, and I'm like you. I enjoyed it thoroughly. <laughs> Somebody 
invites somebody to come to church. One more story, and then I'm done. There's a single mom, and she was in the store. And she'd been abandoned and abused and broken and divorced and left to raise a little boy by herself. And she was just in the store, and guess what? There was a lady from church in there, and she invited her to come to church, and she came. And when she walked in the door, she felt something. She hadn't felt that way for a long time. She felt love, acceptance, welcome. And it was magnetic, so she started coming to church. One Sunday night, the pastor closed the service and just said, you know, if you're here and you need prayer, I want you to come forward. And she needed prayer, but she also had all kinds of shame, and it paralyzed her in her seat. A few minutes passed, and her son, her young son, grabbed a hold of her pant leg and got her attention and told his mama, I said, Mama, Mama, we need prayer. And she said, I know we do, honey. It'll be all right. Jesus will take care of us. He said, but Mom, we need prayer. Finally, she said, okay, let's pray right here. And he said, no, Mama, I want to go up there. And he went up. The pastor got down on one knee and looked him in the eyes and said, Son, what do you want Jesus to do for you? He said, I want Jesus to bring my daddy home. And so they prayed. Things got worse and worse, but one Sunday night, the single mom came to church with her little boy and her ex-husband. And when asked if he would believe on Jesus, the ex-husband said, yes. Their lives were transformed, their marriage reconciled, more children added to the family. And it was all because somebody had faith, somebody had love, and somebody invited them to come to church. And you see, I tell that story, and I've been telling it for a long time because that single mom sitting right here, and her name's Sherry, and she's my wife. That little boy is my son, Jason, and I'm that ex-husband. And so I want to encourage you, commission you to have eyes of faith, a heart full of love, and to just see people around you and make a simple invitation to bring them to church. Because what happened to me that night is God has this radical plan. This radical plan happens when we believe. God's radical plan was to recreate me, my wife, us, in a moment, to recreate us without us losing a breath or missing a heartbeat. He had the ability to recreate us. Jesus said it like this, you must be born again. And to be born again, it requires one thing. It requires faith. And God is so good in that. He gave us the faith that we needed. The Bible tells us that he gave unto each man the measure of faith to believe that Jesus rose from the dead. You see, Jesus came to this earth. He lived a sinless life. He went to a cross, and there on the cross, he was punished for our sin, all of our sin. And God said that he saw his sacrifice and was satisfied. He went into the tomb and three days later rose again, having conquered every enemy that could stand against us and obtained the power for all of us to be born again. But you might be here today, and if I ask you the question, have you been born again? And if you say no, then today is your opportunity to experience a radical recreation of your life. Not make you better, but make you over. If I say, have you been born again? And you say, 
I just don't know, then today is the day for you to use your faith and to believe on Jesus. So could we do this out of reverence for God and respect for one another? Could we just bow our heads and close our eyes? If you're here today and you say, Jimmy, I'm not born again. Or Jimmy, I don't know if I'm born again. In just a moment, I'm going to ask you to raise your hand. And we're just going to pray a prayer together. And it's going to start you on the journey of discovering this radical recreation that God has for you called being born again. If you're here today and you say, Jimmy, I'm not born again. Or Jimmy, I don't know if I'm born again. Right now, would you lift your hand, and we're going to pray together. Thank you, thank you, thank you so much. Thank you for being honest. Don't be afraid. This is you and God. This is you connecting to God. You're raising your hand and saying yes to the Father who loves you. Thank you, hon. I see that. Thank you so much. It's just you saying yes to God, that you want to know Him, that you want to experience this radical new life that He has for us. Okay, we're going to pray a prayer together. And church, I want us all to pray with these that raise their hand. Let's pray like this. Let's say, Lord Jesus. Let's say, this is all the church. Let's say, Lord Jesus, I come to you just as I am, a sinner. And I turn from my sin and I give myself to you. I want to be born again. I want to be recreated. I want to be born anew. Come into my heart. Reside in me. Give me your spirit. And give me power to follow you. And I thank you for it. Now let me pray for these folks that lifted their hands. Father, may this moment be life-changing. May it be radical. May it be transforming. And Lord, may they know even in their emotions and in their senses that they have been made right with you and that there's a clean slate, that they've been recreated. And Lord, may they have a hunger and a quest in their heart for the things of God, for the word of God and the house of God. And Lord, may they forever be changed in Jesus' name. Amen. Come on, church, let's celebrate these folks. Greatest thing ever. Greatest thing ever.